doing the same thing over and over, expecting the same result. That is the definition of what? Say it with me. Insanity. You know that, right? But so often in our relationships, that's what we do. We do the same thing over and over and over, and we expect a different result. And that is silly. Maybe instead of looking at what culture has to say, or what the latest magazine has to say, or what your neighbor who has no clue about relationship has to say, maybe we should look at what the Bible has to say about relationships. Because God made us, and he has our best interest at his heart, and he wants us to shift in the way that he would want us to have relationships. I want to talk about shifting here just a little bit. Have you ever done this game where you try to balance a broom just with your hand? Now, there's two ways you can do this, uh, and it really requires focus both ways. The first way you can do it is you can look at your hand, and hopefully the camera guys can fix this, and I don't hit you, Aaron, or Nick in the front here. But you focus your hand on the bottom of the thing, and it's really, really hard to do. I would challenge you to try to figure that out, okay? You focus on your hand, you try to balance. It's just, it's very, very difficult. But if you make a shift, okay? If you make a shift and you focus on the top of the broom, looky here. How about a round of applause for your very, very talented pastor who's just taking this all over the place. I could maybe do a trick or something, but it's amazing how when we shift our focus onto the right things and in the right place, things become so much easier. And that's our desire for you in all of your relationships. If you're married, your married relationship, we want the very best for you. We want the very best for you, and so we're going to give you all kinds of insight into that. If you're single, and maybe you're dating right now, this is such a wonderful time to be a part of the church, because you're going to get all kinds of information about how this is really going to help you to be able to diagnose things that are difficult, to, to fix it, and get it right, moving in the right direction. If you have no interest in dating right now, you just want to be friends with people and just kind of hang out, enjoy life, Same principles are going to apply in friendships. This applies to everyone. Here we go. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. This is our key verse for the entire series. We're going to look at it every single week, and we're going to tell you if you can get this right, all your relationships are going to be really good. If both people in the relationship can get this right, it's going to really work. So we're going to read it together. I'm going to have you say the words that are underlined and bolded with me. Here we go. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus. If we have the same mindset of Christ, each person, your relationships are going to get better. The best thing that can happen to you in your relationships is not that you're just in church. Glad that you're here. Online, in person, it's great. But more importantly, that Jesus Christ is in you. And he's living in you. And he's living out these wonderful, wonderful principles that he's given to us. So I want to begin by giving proper credit Uh, to what we're going to be talking about today. There's a psychologist by the name of Dr. John Van Epp, and he came up with a truly brilliant thing called the Relationship Attachment Model. I want to give him full credit. It's an incredible thing that he's come up with, and it's the biblical progression of relationships. And if you can imagine, these are kind of like sliders on on a kind of a soundboard. And if you're like me in high school and you had your, you know, radio stereo in your, in your car, you want to crank those up to the very, you know, the highest level you can possibly get so that you can have the best music. Well, that's the same idea in our relationships. The first one is to know the other person. That's going to be our topic for today. Next week, we're going to look at trust, and then the third week, rely, the fourth week, commit, and the last week, intimacy. And what's really, really great is we go to the next slide. If you get all those sliders moving up and in the right direction, you're going to have a great relationship. But sadly and unfortunately, I think it's just a a pure ignorance kind of a thing. In our culture today, if we listen to what the culture would have to say, or if we listen to what someone else is going to have to say, we skip the first three. Oftentimes, we skip the first four. And we jump right into intimacy. But we don't know the person. We certainly haven't had an opportunity to trust them. There's not been a moment where we could rely upon them. No one's made a commitment. We're just jumping to the last one, or we're jumping to the fourth one, and we're getting it all out of order. They build on each other. They build on each other. To our next slide, we're going to talk about knowing the person today. Whenever you can know someone, you've built the foundation of the house. And you can put up the walls, trust. You can put up the roof, rely. You can put up the shingles, the windows, all the stuff that follows that. But you've got to get this first one right. If we don't get it right, we're going to be in big, big, big trouble. So here's what we're going to do today. We're going to make an investment of time, okay? 
The way you get to know someone is you've got to make the investment of time. Uh, my dad always said, the way you spell love is T-I-M-E. Now, was he a bad speller? No. He just knew that the most important thing that you can do, one of the most important things you can do in a relationship, is spend time with the other person. Now, raise your hand in a relationship if you've ever heard— oh, actually, I'll do it two different ways, okay? Whenever you drop something on the ground and it's food and you're a guy— there's something called the five-second rule. Have you ever heard that rule? You know, it's like if you pick it up within five seconds, you can eat it, okay? Usually girls don't do this, but I do this all the time, right? It's a 20-second rule, two-day rule. I don't care if it's good food, I'm going to pick it up. In relationships, there's this thing called the 90-day rule. Does anybody know what that is? Pure science. Really? None of you, like, study this like I do all the time? Here we go. About half of all dating attraction is significantly altered by some newly found characteristic, which is usually negative, within the first 90 days. It's an amazing thing. Usually people, if they can make it past the first 90 days, they start to get to know each other like the real person, and they are able to kind of adjust figure that out, or they're able to be like, I don't want anything to do with this particular person. First Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, it's amazing scripture, it says this, the Lord does not look at the things people look at. Again, I want you to say the words that are bolded and underlined. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Let me give you context of that particular scripture. Samuel was told by God to go and anoint the next king. He went to this guy's house, and he had 12 kids, all boys. The guy parades Son number one, son number two, son number three, son number— and all the way through, and Samuel's like, nope, 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 nope. They get all the way through 11, and he's like, do you got any more kids? And the father says, well, I got one little scrawny guy that's out in the pasture. He's not worth a whole lot. Doesn't look too good. Bring him in. He brought him in. Samuel said, that's the one. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. By the way, does anybody know who that was? That was King David. A man described in the Bible as a man after God's own heart. See, he may not have looked all that impressive on the outside, but he had an amazing inside. Ladies, what's the first question when you're dating a guy that your girl's friends ask you about him? Say it out loud. What does he look like? Or, this is also a pretty common question, what's he do? What's his career? Does he make a lot of money? Hey, that's great. Let's stay with him kind of thing, right? <laughs> Guys, what's the first question when dating, when you're, you know, dating a lady? What do your friends ask you? What does she look like? Is she hot? What's the second question? What does she look like? Is she hot? What's the third question? <laughs> what does she look It's just kind of how we're wired. It's really sad. Okay? The outward appearance is very important. But you know what's also really important? The inside. And so if you're young here today and you're a girl, you got some good looking guy and you realize in the first 90 days that he's an idiot, run. <laughs> okay? Don't put up with that. Don't put up with that. Base your relationship on what God says we should base our relationships on. We gotta spend time. The more you spend time with the person, the more you get to know them on the inside. Um, I've been dating and married to Rochelle. We dated first, then got married, okay? I've been dating and married to Rochelle for over 29 years, and I'm still getting to know her. She is a fabulous lady. Now, what's really interesting is she's teaching in Seneca today. And she's going to say these same things. And I've got a spy over there to see what she's going to say about me. Okay, so I just said something really nice. And it's on, it's recorded, okay? I can't wait to hear what, you know, She's learning about me. I'm learning about her all the time. I never figure it out. I've got to take time to spend with her. Back to our text. Here we go. Philippians chapter 2, uh, verse 2. We're kind of spending a lot of times in Philippians 2, the first few verses. It says, make my joy complete by being, say it with me, by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. How are you going to be of one mind if you don't know what's going on in the other person's mind? If you don't know the person, how's that going to work out? You've got to know the other person to be of one mind. 
So I give you a little bit of advice from my grandfather and grandmother. They were married for over 70 years, okay? Uh, they, they passed away. They just, they got old, right? But they stayed married. I remember two things. This is fun. The first one was kind of funny. I remember showing up and my grandfather was like, you know, Nate, I've been watching, you know, in the classified or in the newspaper where people have been married 30, 40, 50 years and they get divorced. He said, I could never understand that until today. You know, he's like, then I, I get it. Like, I'm, he was pretty frustrated with my grandma. The other thing that I remember still to this day, prior to getting married, I said, what's the secret, grandpa? And he said, you got to be one. He said, when you get into a marriage relationship, any relationship, it's not what you want, it's what you want together. It's being unselfish. You've got to be one. If you want your marriage to stay in tune, stay in tune with one another. Spend good quality and quantity time together. You don't just choose which, oh, it's good quality time, but we don't have much quantity. No, do both so that you can know one another. Let me give you a challenge if you're uh, married and you have kids. Leave your kids at home. Have a date night with your spouse. Let me press in and hear my heart. I love you, but some of you are valuing your kids more than your spouse. You're placing them as a priority above your husband or above your wife. And that's out of order. The Bible teaches us that it's God's first, God is first, our spouse is number two, and then our kids. They're great. We love kids. So hear my heart. I love kids. They're great. We have great kids. We spend time with them. But we make sure we take time for our married relationship. And taking time does not look like this as a family. Check this out. Is that good quality or quantity time? <laughs> okay. Is that what your family dinner looks like? It's what ours does from time to time. I'm on the computer, Rochelle's checking things on the phone, the kids are plugged in. Hopefully your marriage doesn't look like this. We gotta be careful. We gotta be careful. We don't wanna miss opportunities to get to know one another. That's why we wanna help you with this. Everybody get a white bag on the way in. If you're watching online, you can go out and grab a bag and you can kind of be a part of this. Everybody go ahead and grab your bag that you got on the way in. This is kind of a cool thing. If you open it up and you look inside, you're gonna see two flyers. Both are very, very important. The first one is here in the Manuka campus next week. We're gonna have the food truck rally. How awesome is that? You get to come to church and then hang out and have food trucks. We've got three of them coming. All the information is right there. Last week, we uh, put our, our initiative out that we're gonna do, hey, a local, a regional, and a global initiative. Initiative. We want to sell something. We want to have people sign up for roundups. We can raise $2,500 for each one and give that money away. Clothes, shoes uh, locally. Miss Pearl helping her with her coffee house in uh, Roseland. And then globally, we're going to pack meals for people um, who need food and send it over to Haiti. The reason for the bag is here's what we want you to do, okay? We want you to take this bag home. And, and ladies, you're probably going to need to be responsible for this. The guys might not do a very good job of it. T somebody take responsibility. When you have your next time of dinner, this is a really amazing thing. Take your phones. Get everybody's phones. Open the bag. Put it in the bag. Take it outside. Throw it in a river. No, don't do that. Don't do that. You take your phones. You put it in the bag. You put them on silence. And you put it in the other room. And you spend time together. And watch what God does. Spend time together. Talk to your kids. Talk to your spouse. Turn the TV off. Turn the technology off. Here we go. That was a long time on number one. I got to hustle. Now I got two more to go. How do you know and grow in a relationship? You make the investment of time. The second thing you do is you act on what you know. Once you get to know someone, you start to take action on that. We're going to go back to the scripture. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. You know what the biggest problem in all relationships is? Selfishness. That's it. Somebody gets selfish, and you got a problem. But what if our relationship looked like what the Scripture tells us to do? Don't be selfish. Don't be vain. Don't be conceited. Rather in, say the next word with me, even though it's not underlined, rather in humility. When we're humble, it breaks down all the walls. In humility, value others your spouse, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, above yourselves, not looking to, say it with me, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others, right? 
We're not going to be selfish. We're going to focus on the other person. So married relationship, husband and wife, maybe uh, dating relationship, husband and wife. Uh, let me give you some real, uh, you know, there's thousands of books written on relationships. They're all good. I'm sure they're helpful. But the most simple thing that you got to know is very simply on the screen. It's what the Bible's told us all these years ago. It's because God made us. He knew what we needed. Men need love. Women, no, they don't. Men need respect. <laughs> Women need love. Each man must love his wife as he loves himself. And a lot of you like yourself pretty good. So you might want to really transition that to your wife. And the wife must respect her husband. Why would God say this? Because he made us and he knows what makes us work. Shanti Felding did a survey. By the way, I'd recommend any book that she's ever written. It's really, really, really good stuff. Biblically based on relationships. She had to study a survey of, of men and she said, would you rather spend the rest of your life without the respect of your wife or alone and unloved? Those are the two options. Would you rather spend the rest of your life without the respect of your wife or alone and unloved? You want to take a guess which people choose? 74% chose one of them. Alone and unloved. Men would rather be alone. Think about how pathetic we are, men. This is terrible, right? We'd rather be alone and unloved than in a relationship where our wife or our girlfriend does not respect us. Aretha Franklin had this great song all these years ago. She spelled it out. You know what I'm going to say? You want me to sing it? I'm not going to sing it. Thank you, Tim, for saying no. R-E-S-B-E-C-T, da 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 what that means. I don't even know what the song is. Did she write? By the way, it was a Billboard national hit. Did she write the song, or did somebody else write the song? Otis Redding, a man, wrote the song. After... He went through a very difficult relationship. I challenge you to go back and look at the words and look at it from the husband perspective or from the man's perspective. So here's your action step, ladies. Ready? This week, at some point, say to your husband, say to your boyfriend, hey, I respect you for this. Just say it. Now, some of you are thinking, if I do that, Nate, he'll know that it's because of this sermon. Don't worry, he's so insecure, he won't even care. It'll just be, just, just go ahead and say it. It'll mean so much to him. And I'm being honest about that. I'm being completely honest. If you just say it out loud. Now, don't pick something you don't respect. Like, actually mean it, okay? Like, something that's really real. If you just say it, his, his love for you will grow massively. Because he knows that you respect him. And guys, it's going to be your turn going on here pretty soon. The next step for you is to show your love for your wife, for your girlfriend, by accepting her and demonstrating that she is your priority. That she is your priority. There should never be a day where she does not know that you love and accept her. Be proud of her. Show your love for her in public. This is, I'm terrible at this, so I'm preaching to myself. But, you know, hold hands as you're walking down the mall or wherever you're walking around, okay? Put your arm around her while you're watching TV. One guy just said, you know, I, I hold my wife's hand all the time. Why do you do that? Well, because I'm afraid if I let go, she's going to shop. You know, don't, that's not what we're going for, okay? <laughs> not what we're going for. It's a terrible joke. I shouldn't have threw that one in. I apologize to all the women in the room right now. I mentioned this earlier. I'm going to come back to it. Take her on a date every week. And you're thinking, we can't afford that. How much does youth sports cost? You can afford it. How much does that new golf club cost? Oh, I shouldn't have said that. Now I'm going to get mad. You can afford it. You just have to prioritize it. You just have to say, this is a priority. Date night every week is a lot cheaper than divorce. Every man is insecure and needs to hear that he's respected. And I'm going to say this. I'm not a woman, so I'm a little nervous. But I've checked with several different women on this, and they've said it's okay to say it. Okay? There's very few women alive, and maybe none, who wake up in the morning and say, 
I'm good enough, I'm pretty enough, and people like me. There's very few ladies that wake up and say, I matter, I'm valued. When you show that, when you reinforce that in her, she'll be able to respect you, and as you redo that again, she'll be able to respect you anymore, and it's just this amazing, amazing, amazing thing that happens. We continue on with the scripture because the scripture is true. Philippians chapter 2 verses 3 through 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Remember we just saw this but I want to remind you because it's all what this is about. Rather in humility value others above yourselves not looking to, say it with me, your own interests but each of you to the interests of others. It goes like this. It's God's number one your spouse is number two and so on and so on. And we're unselfish with one another. So we make the investment of time. That's the first thing that we talked about today. We act on what we know. We just take action on that. We just gave you the action steps. Put the phones up. Say it. Show it. Etc. And number three, and this might be the most important, is you got to know where your identity comes from. you got to know where your identity comes from. I'm going to show you a little picture on the screen of a famous movie. Does anybody know the title of this movie from where this picture is taken? Jerry Maguire. Raise your hand if you've seen the movie Jerry Maguire. I was afraid I'm too old and people are, okay, so a lot of people have seen it. That's good. That's awesome because I'm getting older. This is a pretty cool movie. There's a famous line here where he's looking at, uh, is it Renee Zellweger? Is that who he's looking at? And he's just looking at her and he says three very powerful, romantically stupid words. Are you ready for this? What are the words? He says, okay, everybody was a little nervous right? You complete me. The stupidest, dumbest thing that I've ever heard. But everybody was like, oh, it's so wonderful. They're, they love each other, and you can find completion in another person. Can you do that? No. You can find a great relationship, and you can find a great match, and you can do all those things, but the word complete? Let me just tell you, if you if you put that kind of pressure on a friendship, on a dating relationship, on a spouse, that's way too much. Another person who is flawed and selfish and sinful cannot complete you. There's only one person in the world, in the universe, who can complete you, and that's God. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19 you got to know where your identity comes from. May you experience the love of Christ. Then you will... Just, I'm going to read this slow. I get in a hurry sometimes. It's very important. May you experience the unconditional love of Christ who loves you no matter what, in spite of your failures, in spite of your falls, in spite of all the things that you do wrong, he still loves you unconditionally. And when you start to place your identity in that, you will be made, say the next word with me, you will be made complete. With all the fullness of life, and the power that comes from God. That is an amazing scripture. If you are placing your identity in your workplace, if you are placing your identity in another person, if you're placing your identity in a sports team, if you're placing your identity in anyone but the love of Christ, you are going to be let down. You're going to be let down. But when you focus your soul identity on the love of Christ, the Bible says you'll be made complete with all the fullness of life and the power that comes from God. I am so blessed to be married to a woman who places her identity in Christ. When we've both placed our identity in Christ, we can begin to really grow in our relationship together. We have troubles. We have struggles. I'm a guy. I'm an idiot. Everybody knows that. These things happen, but we've got to get this right. We've got to get this right. Let's go to our next slide. When two incomplete people come together, they make a, say it with me, complete mess. Here's the good news. Next slide. 
when two complete people come together who place their identity on Christ, and that's the core of who they are. When two complete people come together who are completed in Jesus Christ, God can do something, say it with me, God can do something beautiful. He can do something beautiful in your lives. Let's go back to the Scripture. Let's go back to the Scripture. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his advantage. You ever think about that? God could have just stayed in heaven and said, forget it. I don't want to come to earth. I don't want to have to die for your sins. I don't want to have to do those things. I got all the power. But he didn't do that. We read on. Look at the scripture. He took the very nature of a servant. He put your needs before his. He put you first, and he became number two. He was made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself. And he was even obedient to God the Father to die for you. And not just to die, but to die on the cross. Jesus did for you what you couldn't do for yourself. He used his strength for you, not against you. That's countercultural. He didn't consider his high position and took advantage of it. He chose to complete you. Tim Keller is a great author, great writer, great pastor. He writes these words about being known and loved. He says, to be loved and, to, and not be known, to be loved and not be known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. People really know who I am. I don't know if I can, I don't know if they'll love me. But to be fully known and truly loved is a lot like being loved by God. It's what we need more than anything. It liberates us from pretense. It humbles us out of our self-righteousness, and it fortifies us for any difficulty, any difficulty that life may throw at us. Every great relationship comes down to one core thing, to know and to be known, and to be loved anyway. To know and to be known and to be loved anyway. That's what Christ has done for you, and that's what he asks us to do for one another. One last time. So glad you're at church today, but we're going to go to the scripture one last time, because this is our heart, is that you would live out the scripture, and your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Great, glad you're here, but you got to get Christ in you. You got to let him complete you. You got to let him do the work in you, and then you can begin to go in that direction. We've got a new thing for this particular series, and we're hoping that it's a, it's a thing that continues on. We've got a QR code that you can see right there on the screen. If you're watching online, you can go ahead and take a picture of that particular QR code. If you're here, you can take a picture of that QR code, or you can go to our website, and we've got continue the conversation guides for you. So maybe you're like, hey, husband and wife, let's work on this this week. We heard about it on Sunday, but let's not forget about it on Monday, Tuesday, and then it's kind of out of mind. Let's work on it this week. We've got some great action steps. We've got some great ways for you to continue the conversation. Take advantage of that. When you have to sit down for dinner, put the phones up and talk about things that matter. Look at what the Bible has to say. And it will bless you. It will bless you in your relationships amazingly. It'll help you to be a better mom or dad. It'll help you to be a better husband and wife. It'll help you to be a better dating relationship person. We are for you. Thanks for joining us for that message. If you made a decision to follow Christ or you're just ready to take a next step, we would love to be able to assist you and serve you in that way. You can Allow us to do that by simply texting the two words next step to 815-792-9006. We'll make sure to follow up and help you with those decisions and serve you in the very best way possible. Thank you so much for joining us and we hope to see you again real soon.